All right, we might um, get things underway. Everyone, thank you very much for joining us um, on this Thursday morning. Um, we've got a fantastic panel here. Um, so I'll give a little bit of a pricey about each of our um, guests who've kindly agreed to come on board and share some of their expertise. Um, and then we'll get into a conversation. Um, just um, by way of admin, we're happy to take questions throughout. Um, there is a Q&A function, um, so if you can, if any questions occur to you along the way, please um, put them in the chat box and we'll endeavour to get to them as we go, or if not, we'll, um, we'll deal with them at the conclusion of the presentation. Um, we should be wrapped up um, before nine o'clock, so you can all get off to your work day. So, um, uh, most of you know Aitken Partners being um, on our list and joining us for previous webinars. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the principals here at Aitken. I'm, a, I'm an insolvency and commercial disputes lawyer. Uh, you'll be happy to know we're not talking about insolvency or commercial disputes today. Um, it's a much more interesting topic of building uh, business resilience in a post-COVID world. And we've got some different perspectives from a, a couple of business owners, um, from a uh, leadership and management consultant, and from a mental health expert. So hopefully we can get a, a really interesting conversation going, get some different perspectives. Um, so firstly, Alon Casuto from Maximus International. Um, Alon is a principal at Maximus, which is uh, an innovative leadership consultancy. He's a leader, consultant, facilitator, and coach. Um, over the past decade, Alon has worked with executives and some of Australia's best known businesses to help them transform um, and deliver um, some incredible breakthroughs and results. Um, the, the lesser known fact about Alon is that he and I were junior lawyers together before he saw the light and thought he was much better at the uh, leadership consulting aspect than, um, than the pure law. So he brings an interesting perspective from that front. Um, Alon, can you um, give a little bit of background about yourself? And um, in particular, I'm interested in giving, we will be looking into the crystal ball um, a bit today. Can you tell me what, future focused means from the perspective of Maximus? Yeah, sure. Alex, um, thanks for having me and good to reminisce on our days as a junior lawyer and um, there's still there's, there's still hope for you, my friend. So uh, if you're looking for a career change, just email me your CV and I'll see what I can do. Um, it. But it's, look, I, I, uh, I saw, I, I've been in the leadership space for the past 10 years. And for me, um, when I think of leadership, it's helpful to, to understand why I do what I do. And for me, leadership is where, as humans, we can have a disproportionate impact on the world around us. So if you think of this concept of leaders, it's how do I mobilize others towards a common purpose or goal? And so if we're only on this earth for a finite amount of time, and we wanna be able to really make an impact, to me, leadership is, is the key to that. And so that's what drew me to leadership. Um, I love what I do. It's all about creating space for um, reflection and a different style of thinking, but also to have a different level of conversation. So when we think about um, leadership at Maximus, uh, we started um, over 20 years ago and it, uh, Maximus was founded by a young woman by the name of Vanessa Gavin when she was in her 20s. And it was started as a challenger spirited firm that was um, seeing that leadership development wasn't done in a particularly creative or inspiring way, um, but that leadership was deeply important. So uh, Maximus is basically there to partner with leaders with quite ambitious agendas. And what we say to these leaders is expect something unreasonable of yourself, expect something more of the people that you lead. Um, and this remains at the core of what we do. So when we're thinking about um, leadership now, and we're thinking about the future of leadership, uh, we're all in quite a privileged and unique time in history because we're living and we're working and we're leading through this great transition. And it's a unique transition in history because we're going from 20th century to 21st century workplaces and organizations. We're going from an industrial model of how to work, how to lead, how to use um, employees and, and workforces into a 21st century uh, model. So moving from a focus on efficiency, on hierarchy, on authority, which was very much the, the industrialized way of running a business to a 21st century model where it's actually not about how many employees you have and how many clear roles you have. It's about how do you connect people to a sense of purpose? How do you connect ideas to action? How do you create collaboration? And this demands a real transition from leaders as well. So this is at the core of what we mean by future focus. We're, we're building leaders who are 
fit to lead these 21st century organizations. And some of the key characteristics of those future focused leaders um, that we're seeing actually as being quite lacking in a lot of established Australian businesses are real clarity of purpose, um, a real curiosity to explore beyond our small pond in Australia and, and beyond our borders, a real courage to challenge, um, the ability to really drive emotional commitment in the people that you lead because um, humans at their core are emotional beings. And I think this is often underappreciated, especially in professional services firms. We're psychologically hardwired to seek belonging, to give emotions the upper hand over rational thought. Even lawyers, accountants, we're the same thing. We're, we're highly emotional creatures. So we, as we're headed into a place where there's so much more job mobility, where people are going to be reassessing their options, um, those leaders who can create emotional commitment in their people are going to have a massive advantage in the market. So an example of this is we were working with a CEO recently who said, look, my executive team are really, really stuck in the operational. I need to be able to shake them up. I need to get them thinking big. I need to get them thinking across multiple horizons, not just on what's immediately in front of them. So together, um, we built with this CEO a unique uh, global virtual study tour where we took his executive team to meet with leaders and disruptors in Israel and Singapore, in Silicon Valley, in Hong Kong. And we created a, a range of different incredible conversations on relevant industries and, and future technologies that were going to be um, directly relevant to his business. So what they got is to see and feel the future. They formed relationships with companies who were on the forefront of uh, artificial intelligence or big data. And so when we think about those relationships, that's what's going to pay dividends in the coming decades. That's what's going to set up businesses to be resilient and future focused. So that's what we mean by future focused leadership. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Lon. There's a few things that we'll touch on um, in that in a, in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, I'd, I'd also like to in, introduce Graham Haas. So Graham is a um, solicitor with more than 20 years of experience, um, but he is also now a lecturer at the Queensland College of Law. Um, and runs a mental health in the workplace course, um, which one of our employees um, recently did, and Graham was the facilitator. So today he's um, here to talk about the importance of dealing with mental health as it applies to the resilience of a business and its owners and its employees, obviously, um, which is, um, as we know, a really important perspective to have uh, in any workplace at any time, but particularly so when you're less connected um, by a, a common um, office space. So Graham, can you firstly tell me a little bit about yourself? How did uh, Felicita come to um, where you are now teaching a course on mental health? Thanks very much, Alex, and thanks, Alon. I'll, I'll follow on from something that you said uh, there shortly too. Well, yes, uh, I was a solicitor, uh, working full time, young lawyer, battling away there. And uh, anxiety was a real thing. We never talked about it. 15 years ago when I was working full time, we never talked about it. It was right about the time Beyond Blue was kicking in nationally. But as a profession, we wouldn't talk about anxiety or depression. We would just drink ourselves into oblivion. We got four times the rate of alcoholism as the rest of the community. And that's how we treated it all. And we have these backwards dinosaur approaches to mental health. And we'd say things like, if the kitchen's too hot, get out of the kitchen, take a teaspoon of cement and harden up. When I was a young lawyer, I dealt with it. All these really backwards attitudes to mental health that really said, we don't understand what's going on here. So uh, it came to a point where I did the practice management course and thought, well, do I stay as a lawyer and go and set up for myself? And then this opportunity came up teaching. And uh, uh, I'm not boasting when I say that, uh, unfortunately, I was born to teach. It's not something you brag about at parties or, tr or something you say to impress people, but I really love teaching. So when that opportunity came up to teach post-grad law students the, uh, at the College of Law, uh, I jumped at it. Well, five years into my, after I started there, we started, well, we decided that law students are really battling with mental health issues themselves. We need to do something about this. So we started training post-grad law students in relation to uh, well-being, anxiety and depression and substance use issues and that sort of thing. Uh, and they loved it. They absolutely uh, uh, th thought it was fantastic that somebody was taking the time to start talking to them about these issues. That was 10 years ago. We've trained 20, 30,000 students in relation to mental health since then. So word is getting out there. Uh, the stats are telling us that we're, we're, as a society and as a profession, we're changing where we're, the stigma is reducing when it comes to talking about this mental health stuff. The younger generations are much smarter with it and much more able to talk about it. 
So in the recent years, we decided, well, let's get into the profession now. Let's go into law firms and, and start uh, teaching this mental health first aid course. So that's when I became a mental health first aid instructor. And over the last few years, I've been going into uh, many, many law firms and running these courses for HR people, running this mental health first aid course for HR people and office managers and lawyers and partners. And they just love it because people are actually taking the time to talk to them about, well, how do I have a conversation with somebody who's uh, having a pen or uh, suffering depression or anxiety or might have a substance use issue? How do I have a conversation with somebody who might be having suicidal ideations? How do I deal with a client or a person who might be having a psychotic episode? And uh, people really love this course. And I think by talking about these issues and reducing the stigma, we are in a much better position to take care of our, our own mental health. You know, with the physical health, we sort of know what's going on. Um, we sit at a desk all day and our neck gets sore and our back gets sore, so we have to do something to look after ourselves. And uh, it's the same with our, with our mental health. It doesn't look after itself magically. We need to take steps to look after that. And just following on from what Alon was saying before, yes, we are emotional creatures, us humans, even lawyers. And we try to pretend not to be and be very objective as, and professional wherever we can. But they say lawyers are primarily motivated by fear. If there's no deadline, it doesn't happen. So uh, hopefully I can uh, we can talk a little bit about um, some of the battles that people are going through at the moment as a result of COVID and some practical steps uh, that people can take, managers can take and employees can take as well to, to look after themselves a little bit while they're working remotely and, and dealing with these issues associated with COVID. So very much looking forward to this discussion. Fantastic. Thank you, Graeme. Um, and while, while the stigma is certainly reducing and um, that's fantastic, there's still a lot of work to be done um, in the legal profession in particular, as well as society at large. So I'm interested to progress that conversation with you. Um, and lastly, thanks to both Reese Pedler and Nick O'Halloran for joining us this morning. Um, Reese and Nick are both um, partners in Hamilton Morello, which is a sizable accounting practice based in Forest Hill um, and the firm we turned to recently for some advice. So we can highly recommend them. Um, their expertise is slightly different. Reese practices in business advisory services, succession planning, tax structuring advice and the like to clients across Victoria. Um, Nick is a financial planner who works with small and um, to medium sized business owners and in individuals, essentially offering holistic advice to help them achieve their financial goals. Um, so Reese, if I can turn to you first, um, from a business advisory perspective, um, how have those services that you offer changed during COVID? What, what challenges have you faced um, in, in actually delivering your um, key services to clients? Morning, everyone. Yeah, good to be with you this morning. Um, I guess the, the main change with our services that we've, uh, compared to what we normally provide is we've just been a lot more engaged with the clients. So, um, you know, obviously we, we're there to, um, to give advice and be involved with our clients' businesses. Um, that tends to be a little bit more um, ad hoc than what it has been um, in the last 18 months. Uh, it's, it's been a real, uh, a very tumultuous time for our clients. Uh, and so we've been involved in doing a lot of planning, um, a lot of work around cash flow. Um, you know, we, we've been a good sounding board for them to, to really just, you know, I've got this much cash, this is what I've got available. Um, how are we going to handle the issues that I've got with my suppliers, the tax office and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's not to mention all of the stuff that's happening with the, the support packages that have come out from the state government, um, the federal government, um, lots and even councils, local, local government as well. So um, yeah, I guess we, we have been a lot more engaged with the clients, which has been great for us. Uh, we're lucky that we've been able to continue working uh, full steam ahead and, and really just trying to support our clients through a, a very tumultuous time. Absolutely. Thank you, Reese. Um, and Nick, so um, what have you done to, I suppose, reassure clients and staff during this period? I mean, as Reese just said, it's a pretty tumultuous time. You're dealing with people on, you know, planning for their future financial goals. How, how have you managed to reassure um, both your clients and internally your employees about what's happening next? Yes, yeah, well, thanks, thanks for having me, Alex. Yeah, so I've yeah, been in Hamilton Tomorrow for 14 years, so I was lucky enough to, to be around during the GFC. So that was a really good uh, good training base, I suppose, for, for me to be where I am now to help guide our clients. So we've been prepping our clients, you know, pretty much since the GFC that it, there will be another event. You know, there will be another global financial crisis. There will be another issue. Um, I just didn't realise there'd be a pandemic of this sort of size. So we've been prepping our clients all the way through this 
And so then when it came, they weren't as worried as what they were back, what they were back during the global financial crisis. So, but yeah, so, so they sort of knew things were going to come, um, just didn't realise that, you know, the market would collapse so quickly in sort of four weeks. I mean, the global financial crisis went over sort of nine to 12 months from top to bottom. Well, the top, from top to bottom and during the pandemic was about four weeks. So it was a lot brutal and a lot quicker. So, um, so it was just like what Reese was saying, just been trying to call clients, just, you know, regularly, you know, all the time, just trying to reassure them. We've seen this before, things will recover. Um, we just got to buy that, uh, buy that time, not make stupid decisions. So that was a lot of the things that we were doing that um, trying to reassure clients, not, not to sell out the bottom of the market, you know, things will recover. Um, and so, yeah, so that's our clients have been in great positions because of that, because they didn't make bad decisions at, at the, at the worst possible time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Nick. Um, and I suppose this is a question for, for anyone who wants to jump in, but uh, what are some of the issues that you've seen um, in, in your workplaces around you, um, friends and family um, that arose as employers or advisors when COVID initially disrupted the working environment? Obviously, we've, we've spoken a little bit about the changes that have taken place. And yes, we've had to adjust to working from home and things like that. What, what challenges do you think that's, um, that's given rise to in the, the working community? Can I turn to you first, um, Reese? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um... I guess for us being in professional services um, for our business, it was really around workflows. So um, we, a few years ago, we did a project and put in some new software, uh, which turned out to be a very fortunate thing. Um, but predominantly a lot of our records, um, the main day-to-day -day records that we use are still paper-based or were still paper-based. Um, so this whole situation really forced us uh, at, a, at a very quick pace to change our internal processes and use that part of the software that we just hadn't gotten to yet and um, really enhance that so that we could workflow and um, communicate between us and flow work and tasks around our office remotely. Um, so you, you would think in this day and age that all practices are digital, but it's not always the case. So um, that was a real challenge for us and just upskilling our people and, and communicating with everyone and, and getting that going. Um, I think a lot of people would have been in that boat. Um, and, and yeah, just that change in communication and engaging with staff, I think. Um, we, as a matter of course, have, have weekly meetings where we talk about what work we've got in the office and who's doing what and, you know, is someone overloaded or, or not as, that doesn't have as much work on. Um, and, and so those meetings continued, but uh, we've added extra things into that, added extra um, meetings during the week and things like that to just help engage with the staff, um, really just encouraging staff to, to get on Zoom, get on the phone rather than emailing. Um, emailing. The emails have just gone crazy, I think, since the start of the pandemic. So we've really tried to, um, you know, stop people just emailing as a default and just say, look, get on the phone and talk to people. It's better for your mental health. It's better to be speaking and, and connected with other people. Um, don't just email as a default. So I think that's been the other real challenge along the way. Absolutely. Um, Nick or Graham, did you want to add anything to, to that? Um, yeah, I just think, yeah, there's a lot of issues that have, you know, you, you know, you, you have all these staff and, you know, you try and be engaged with them, but there's a lot of things that sort of came out during the pandemic, the, you know, issues they had working with families. And um, so just trying to, yeah, we've just been trying to, support our staff, you know, for things that we never knew that happened, you know, they were, you know, we noticed one staff member, you know, hadn't done any work for sort of two days and we're like, you know, we call her and she's going okay, but, you know, we finally sort of able to sit down and, you know, dig down and find out, you know, that she was, you know, dealing with a lot of issues. Um, and so we had, we had to put, you know, processes in place to, to try and support her. Um, you know, you know, during the office, you, she just looked like, you know, going about a day, but, you know, deep down she was dealing with a lot of things. So, there's a lot of things that sort of came to the surface during this pandemic that you've had to work through, you know, particularly with staff and, and also clients as well. So I mean, clients, you know, the, a lot of the, the clients that we're dealing with are the main breadwinner of the business. And, you know, when times were tough, you know, there, there's a lot of pressure on them to, 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 come, to come good on that. So, Which is, I suppose, about just staying connected as well, which it's funny yeah. that you say that. Exactly, yeah. You, exactly what they said. That, that in the office you can, you know, everyone goes about their day and you don't notice sometimes when you're a little bit 
less connected physically, um, those issues do arise and um, you, you do need to be very proactive about it, yeah, because you know, it, it, it's very quickly the three or four days goes past when you're working from home and you're like, oh, well, I haven't actually spoken to this person in three or four days. So um, that, that staying connected is something that I've personally certainly found a challenge because you do need to find that time to, to stay connected with people um, around you and, and both from a client and employee, employee point of view. Yeah, I think managers are, uh, find the remote working really difficult to be able to manage people just because they lose that uh, contact and lose those communications. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges here is just trying to remain in touch with, with everybody. People are feeling really isolated. For some people, it's fantastic. Though it's a really positive thing and they've been able to adapt and, and it fits in well with them. But everybody's very different and their own individual circumstances at the time are very different. You might have kids, you might have troubles in a relationship, um, there might be health issues you're dealing with. You might be an extrovert and you really thrive on all of that contact with other people. So uh, COVID anxiety is a very real thing. You we're seeing this from people in Sydney and Melbourne at the moment who very much feel like things are hopeless. Uh, when is this going to end? And there's this frustration and they're, and they're, they're really struggling. So we're dealing with people who, who have these anxieties associated with COVID on, a, on all sorts of levels. Uh, for some people, it's just the isolation and the loneliness. Imagine how tough it would be being at home by yourself. You know, I had a great time last year. I had my partner and I had my cat. I was very happy. Between, one of, between the two of them, one of them were showing affection and kindness towards me. So the odds were in my favour. Uh, but for, just, uh, for people by themselves, it must be an incredible challenge. Um, similarly, people with, with kids, they, they are finding this really difficult as well because it's difficult to be as productive as you are in the workplace. Uh, you've got kids coming in all the time and wanting attention. You're also having to play the role of teacher and probably uh, getting some bad feedback from the kids. My nephew was telling his dad how rubbish a teacher he thought he was, which I thought was a bit brutal. So in addition to having to deal with that, you're getting the criticisms as well. So managing kids can be a challenge. Relationships can be a challenge sometimes. And just getting into different routines, people can feel, feel like it's very difficult to switch off from work. Okay. They'll be checking their emails, working the longer hours. Um, some folks will be having trouble staying motivated. Some folks have trouble knowing how to prioritize the workload, perhaps because they're not able to have those conversations with people around the office and get that information that they might otherwise People are feeling lost as though they don't know how they're going at work. They don't know if they're progressing and they're doing their job okay. They may not be getting that feedback and that validation from the employer and from the people around them that they were getting otherwise. So there's some really there's some real challenges out there for people at the moment, and it just needs a bit more uh, attention, extra attention, and extra effort from from managers to keep an eye on people, as Nick did when they when he found out that one of his employees was struggling there. But you need to take that extra effort because you're missing all these visual cues mm. that you might otherwise have in the workplace. So what do we need to do? Well, have those one-on-ones with your staff just for a chat. It doesn't have to be performance management, but just for a general chat so they can feel like there's a bit of connection there. Because we know what happens in our Zoom meetings. There's a couple of talkers and they run the show and everybody sits there quiet, quietly and can feel guilty about, you know, uh, the listeners will sit there and pay strong attention, but they feel guilty about talking so, so much. So have that one-on-one -on -one with the people that you're, you're not hearing from. Um, more broadly, what are we seeing in some of the statistics and figures? Well, this year we're doing a national uh, survey on mental health. Haven't done that for 10 years, so we're all very excited about that. Some figures, everybody when this started thought we were going to see suicide rates increase. We haven't seen that. We've seen a drop off in suicide rates, uh, which is some good news around the country. What we have seen is an increase in people using mental health services and contacting the mental health service lines. We've seen an increase in females self-harming as well. So there's statistics all over the place and uh, it's really just a matter of prioritising mental health. There's, there's, we can't ignore it anymore, particularly given the anxieties and that, uh, that people are going through and the, the constant change that people are going through. Added to that, the issues that might be having, happening at home with relationships and with health as well and being isolated, not being able to go and have your holidays like you used to, not being able to go to Southeast Asia and sit on the beach, not being able to go and visit your friends and family and loved ones and people who might be sick interstate. So there's some absolute challenges there for people. Indeed. Yeah, to what, Indeed. Um, what Graham was saying, as humans, we have this very strong innate psychological need for, for boundaries and identities. And we actually, they work very strongly in our, in our 
kind of subconscious. Uh, so it's not something we think of, but we, we actually have a different view of ourselves, of how we are at work, how we are at home, how we are when we're with our friends, how we are when we're on holiday. And at the moment, all of those boundaries are blurred. And that actually causes a lot of confusion and anxiety for us. We don't know where to place ourselves. So our home self has come uh, into work. Our work self has come into home. All of that has created a, a real challenge for how we view ourselves and how we show up. And the other thing we've lost is what's called the third space. The third space was that commute or that separation between work and home. So whether it was on the train, whether it was in the car, whether it was riding to work or walking to work, that decompression, that space to actually create some um, both mental but also physical separation has disappeared. And, and that causes a ton of strain because we go from um, meeting with client into the kitchen or into the living room and back into a meeting with client with no separation. So that recreating that third space um, is something that we've been working very purposefully with clients on. How can you force a, a purposeful, mindful separation, whether that's a walk at the end of the day or at the start of a day, whether it's creating a, a space where you go and, and create some alone time because otherwise there's, there's the cumulative effect and something's got to give, it's unsustainable. So that's just something um, else to, to think of. How do you create that separation? I might, I might jump in there. There's some suggestions of that. For instance, you just need to get into those habits and into those routines. So for instance, uh, having a shower before you start your working day. So your mind goes, have a shower, get to work now. At the end of the day, turning off the computer so it's not open uh, for you to go and swing by and have a look in the evening as well. Coming up with a, a routine for your day. How what's, what's the plan for the day going to look like? What everyone What is everyone going to be doing? But somehow coming up with a trigger so you know, I'm starting my working day now and I'm finishing my working day now, whether whether it's your start of the day cup of coffee or putting on your work clothes. Suggestion is, you know, uh, get yourself properly dressed, but nothing wrong with having a pajama day once a week either. But just having some sort of trigger in your mind so you can set up the boundaries between when it starts and when it ends. Because for many people, there, there are no boundaries. It's 24-7 now. Your computer's there and you, you feel that sense that you need to work, particularly if you've got kids and you're not working a standard nine to five. You might feel guilty and I have to make up for that by working crazy hours hours later on so. so i suppose uh, rolling on from that along what, what's what's the role of leaders and business owners in you know i suppose managing this in these difficult times of um you know disconnectedness a uh, lack of boundaries what, what's the role of leaders yeah it's a really good question there's there's the the primary dynamic which we've spoken about this idea of how do you support your staff and how do you connect with them but then there's also the, the secondary dynamic of um, how are, what's, what's happening at a business-wide level. And so we're see, seeing leaders dealing with a massive amount of challenges. And I'm sure that a lot of the people who are, are viewing, and I'm sure that um, Reese and, and Nick and Graham can relate as well, um, beyond business continuity through kind of downturns and, and lockdowns, um, and in some instances, we're seeing businesses who, who are booming and, and can't actually manage because they've got too many limited resources. So you've got these infinite nuances to how business leaders are, are coping with what's going on. But there's some mind-blowing recent stats um, from the Institute for Corporate Productivity, as well as from a bunch of other surveys, like a Microsoft survey that they did on 30,000 of their employees. And they tell this very powerful story of um, both collapse on the one hand, but also renewal on the other, because this has been a prolonged uh, dynamic. And we're seeing stats like 40% of employees who are looking to change jobs in the, in the next six to 12 months. So that's millions and millions and millions of workers around the world who are either quitting or thinking of quitting their jobs because they're dissatisfied. And that's the highest rate that ev they've ever recorded on, um, in, in the surveys. 60% are saying that they're either surviving or struggling at work. Um, burnout is at 67%. Lack of advancement opportunities are seen at 48%. So all, of, all in combination, this has been termed as, as languishing. Um, and languishing is this kind of feeling of prolonged um, exhaustion. So you add to that the fact that 54% of companies are, are struggling to fill roles, that we've got um, some serious workforce challenges like um, I think that in, in 2019, we had 60,000 skilled workers visas, whereas in 2021, it's only 4,900. So that's a 90% reduction in skilled labor coming in. So 
all of that in combination is throwing organizations and leaders into quite um, a challenge. And one of the underlying root causes we're seeing is that because leaders have been running so hard for the past 18 months, trying to salvage business, um, trying to salvage uh, their clients. And what that's created is leadership that's in reactive mode. Leadership that is, um, it'd be fair to say, on a macro level has neglected their people over the past 18 months. And on the flip side, for employees or for people within organizations, they've spent the last 12 or 18 months reflecting on what's really important to them. They've been considering well, what are some of the changes I want to make to who I am, how I show up, where I work, how I add value in this world, my personal professional life, um, what are really my priorities. And so a lot of leaders haven't adapted. They're expecting a return to this kind of 2019 model. Um, they're expecting whether that's a conscious expectation or an unconscious expectation, we're kind of in limbo, we're on hold. And so at a macro level, what that creates is a power dynamic that is shifting in favor of employees and leaders who are getting more and more anxious. So we have have a pretty clear view in that context on what the role of the leader is. Um, and it starts with how do you view your workers? What's the fundamental mindset? And this might seem really obvious, but it's obvious because um, Consciously, we recognize it, but unconsciously, does this align with what we believe? So are employees a cost to be minimized or are they a driver of profit? Are they the source of your pain when business is tough or are they actually the salvation during those challenging times? Are we thinking about monthly budgets and how we can reduce costs? So are we thinking three to five years from now and what would that talent uh, return in terms of investments and dividends? And obviously, there are real constraints and we don't want to think about um, staff retention at the expense of the fundamentals of the business but when you can nurture staff and when you can create a sense of belonging these aren't fluffy concepts these aren't nice to have they're actually the hard-edged commercially astute investments in people that mean that you then have a commercial advantage in the long run so workers are looking for meaning and connection um, how active are we being as leaders on this front are we just expecting it to happen organically through one-on-ones or are we being really purposeful in carving out kind of the habits, practices, spaces for this? So an example for this is at, at Maximus, we've been surprising employees in lockdown with um, coffees and croissants just dropped on their doorsteps. We've been um, surprising them with Uber Eats vouchers. We've been writing personal handwritten letters at the end of every single quarter, commenting on people's specific growth and the impact that we've observed in them that they've had on clients or on the business. So we're celebrating this positive feedback from clients in a company-wide way. And what that leads to is a sense of progress and satisfaction because you zoom out and over an 18 month period, if you're getting a quarterly report on your progress and the impact you're having, you feel a much greater sense of motivation and belonging to stay the course. So it's about talking to people and having the one-on-ones, but it's also about being really purposeful about fostering this belonging. Um, now's not the time for surveys. Now's the time for conversations. Um, now's not the time for emails. You know, as, as Nick pointed out, now's the time for um, meaningful interactions and treating employees well, whether they stay or leave as well. Because if you've had someone leave, they may come back. And if they don't, they're going to shape your employer brand in the market. And that's becoming a much more important factor as well. So what I'd say is in, in combination, um, as leaders, I, I think there is a real need to be purposeful and habitual about how we think about um, creating a sense of progress and belonging amongst our people. That was fantastic. Thank you, Alon. Um, can I perhaps extend that and, and, and turn to Reese and Nick? I mean, what, what are some of the things that you've tried to do in, in, to improve work morale, to, to maintain that connection with with your employees, employees and clients. I know you've touched a little bit on, you know, it, sometimes it's just about actually making sure you make that contact, but are, are there other things that you, you're doing as business owners to, to improve that connection and, and maintain, I suppose, that morale that you want around the workplace? Yeah, I'll jump in here a little bit, but before I answer that question, I'm just gonna go back to a couple of points that Alon made, Alex. Absolutely. Um, yeah, look, just along with your comments in relation to um, the labor force and your employees, 
that is a really big issue. It's probably one of the key issues that I talk about with clients at the moment. Um, labor has become, uh, finding resources and employees has become a real challenge for businesses um, and every industry. It's, it's not one specific area um, or, or type of business that are struggling with this. Um, there is a shortage of labor out there. I don't have a solution for how to fix it. Um, the solution is probably, you know, when we're going to be past this, um, you know, situation. Um, but if, you know, if you are having labor issues within your business, don't feel that you're alone. You know, that there is a lot of people out there that can't find labor. And that means they have to really be very careful with the resources that they've got within their businesses. Uh, so I just wanted to make that comment. Um, but in terms of um, other ways that we help connect with the staff, we've done a few things um, a little bit similar to what Alon had mentioned. Um, so one of our business partners is, is very um, crafty and actually what she did last year, um, she made, uh, what would it have been, Nick, maybe 55 care packages for every one of our um, staff and partners. So um, that was just a really special thing that, that she put together. Um, it had lots of, it was a little box of, you know, um, I, I don't even know. I think the guys and the girls were slightly different. Um, you know, there's a little, some chocolates and chips and, you know, um, hand soap and things like that. Um, you know, our names and a little card and, and different things like that. So um, that was one really special thing that, um, that one of our business partners put together. Um, but other things we've done, you know, we, we try and do the, the virtual Friday drinks every so often. We've done a couple of trivia sessions, which Nick's put together. Um, we've, we've actually just started doing something a little bit different with a couple of our teams. Uh, and we call it, let me just check, it's called the Hump Day Huddle. So Wednesday midday, um, we just have a, a, a chat. We just book a, a Zoom meeting and just to get together. It's a small targeted meeting, so it's about eight people. Um, so, you know, you're not trying to deal with a Zoom meeting of 50 people or anything like that. It's small and, and everyone can engage. Um, and we just have a chat about what's going on with, with everyone's day and, you know, what's happened on the weekend and all those sorts of things. And I, I think it's just a nice way to stay connected. Yeah, try, we try not to talk about work the entire time. So I think that's what's trying to talk about, you know, what the, what the family's up to, what the kids are up to, you know, try and bring it back to what we talk about back at the, uh, the uh, water cooler back in the office. So um, I think, yeah, what Reese said is, is the smaller groups, you know, we've done drinks with, you know, all 55 of us and, and someone mentioned it before, you know, you have two or three dominate the conversation, but when you bring it down to a smaller number, you know, four or five or eight, um, you, can, you can really, you know, it's a lot more engaging. Um, people open up a bit more. So that's what, yeah, what we've been doing. Absolutely. Just, thanks, um, thanks. just a cup, because I, I do this day in, day out. So a couple of tricks which might be helpful in not getting a cert, certain group to dominate the conversation. Um, I, I love the, the um, handing around the, the conch or the, the microphone. So what you do is you say, Nick, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And then you get to nominate who you want to hear from next. And that way, until you rotate through everyone, including those who may not want to normally speak up and you normalize this idea that everyone's voices are heard. That's one kind of tip in meetings. Um, the other one is getting uh, using breakout rooms. So I don't know if you use these in your meetings, but we love them in Zoom and in Microsoft Teams. You've got the functionality to get take a group of 20 or 30 and break them down into small groups of two or three or four. And suddenly a whole new batch of people are speaking up and connecting with one another. And then you bring them back into the main room and you might go over an overview of what was discussed in different groups. Um, so just a, a few tips and techniques on how you can get people talking who might not normally in a virtual context. And the other thing is um, when you're connecting on the one-on-ones, if there's someone who you know is naturally uh, less talkative, it's actually giving them a topic to report back on. So they have a chance to prepare, they have a chance to consider something, they have a chance to um, provide an insight. So whether it's a good uh, experience with a client that happened recently, whether it's a good um, insight into you know a particular technical topic that you want to you want to talk through, or whether it's just something interesting you know that's happened in their lives that would be worthwhile sharing, it's giving them that that early prompt and time to prepare. So if there's someone who is conscientious or, or risk averse, they can show up the way that they want to. Absolutely. 
Really good um, suggestions. Sorry, Alex, it's just so important for people to be heard in those meetings. And what you're saying about the breakout rooms is fantastic. So people can have their say and have those connections with others because the group dynamic is so different to what you get when you're one on one or one on two. Um, so I think it's just so important for us to try and, I mean, have those conversations with people, make sure they're not stuck at home by themselves, dialing into group meetings and not really having much to say. As managers, are you taking that time each week to have a one on one or a meeting with a couple of people? And that sort of, we should, uh, sorry, Anthony, you asked us a question a little while ago and we put that on the back burner. But I was, might, I was, I was about yeah. to jump into that, Graham, but if you want to. Um... Yep. It sort of flows into that, doesn't it? So the, the question is, what are some of the critical questions you can ask employees to help uncover mental health issues without them feeling vulnerable? Well, feeling vulnerable is probably part of it. That's not a bad thing. We've got to be comfortable with vulnerable. We shouldn't be trying to be too stoic. And because we're, guess what? We're all human beings. We're going to have good days and we're going to have bad days. So vulnerable is something we should really lean into. Um, but to get your staff talking about these issues, well, Mm, there's two angles. It might be a performance management issue. If, if it's affecting performance, then you come at it from a performance management issue and deal with that because people may not want to talk about their mental health issues or their struggles and they may not, um, they may feel threatened or defensive about opening up to that. And there's no obligation on people to disclose those health issues. Okay. So it might just be a performance management issue and you deal with it on that basis. But what we re really would like people to do is to be keeping an eye out for each other, not from that performance management perspective but because we give a damn about each other and because we care about our co-workers and our friends and our family and we just keep an eye out for them so the starting point is good relationships don't expect people to open up to you and talk to you if you don't have that uh, relationship of trust if they think that you're going to breach their privacy talk to other people judge them if it's going to affect them in the workplace because that's the culture of the workplace not to talk about mental health stuff or to judge people, then they're not going to open up. But if you've got the right culture there in the workplace, if you've got managers, it starts with management. If you've got management willing to be vulnerable and talk about their own issues and their own struggles and make sure there are resources available for people, well, that sets the tone throughout the rest of the firm that or organization that, yep, we can talk about this stuff. So employers, you need to establish good relationships with people, have that level of trust, be prepared to listen, don't make assumptions about people and just open up that conversation. How are you going at the moment? It must be tough at home. Share something about yourself. People will open up with you if you are vulnerable yourself and you share something about yourself. So other things employers can do is acknowledge that people are battling at the moment. Make sure you explicitly acknowledge that there are some real challenges out there and, and uh, we're here for you. If you need a chat with people, we are here to have a chat with. And if you need help, we're going to connect you with help. Hopefully an employee assistance provider, does your organisation have an EAP that people can access anonymously? If they can't access it anonymously, they won't use it. So if they don't have an EAP, they can start with their GP. They can have a chat with the GP. That's a brilliant starting point. If it's a mental health issue, get them to book in an extended consultation with the GP. Your five minute bulk bill isn't gonna do it. Get them to have a chat with the GP. They might end up in a mental health plan. They might end up on some medication, but supporting people, letting them know it's it won't be against their interests. And that if you need to make reasonable adjustments for people as an employer, because they have that mental health problem that they're, they're dealing with, then you'll make those adjustments. It might be adjustments to working hours or workloads and the nature of the work that they're doing. So to get the culture right in the firm, uh, make the resources available for people so they know who they can go and have a chat with. And uh, to pull out my big, uh, the big plug again for mental health first aid, get as many people trained in the workplace on mental health first aid as you can. It's a relatively inexpensive course. And it just means there are more people in the workplace that people can have conversations with because it's not always going to be one person that everyone wants to go to and have a chat with your mental health officer. But if you have different people from different backgrounds at different levels trained uh, for mental health first aid, then you've got all these people available to have these conversations. I, just, I think I just want to pick up on Graham's first point around vulnerability. It, it, it is so, so undervalued. Vulnerability is reciprocal. Vulnerability is contagious. And vulnerability is really good. It's really powerful. It's really strong. It's what bands humans together. And so if you're expecting your employees to be vulnerable, the first question I'd say to a leader is, how vulnerable have you been with your employees? How much have you shared the, the challenges that you've gone through? What's been difficult for you? Um, how you're coping with the difficulties of homeschooling, how you're coping with the difficulties of not knowing where your, your um, uh, next high is going to come from um, or seeing big 
red lines in your in your PLs. Like I, I think there are there are a whole range of um, conversations that leaders expect to come towards them, but aren't necessarily putting themselves out there. And so I'd say vulnerability starts with how can I share more of myself and what how do I find my natural line in the sand of what I'm comfortable on and courageously step slightly beyond that. I've shared that Brené Brown YouTube or TED Talk on vulnerability. It's an absolute life changer and it's highly entertaining. So it's a, it's a very interesting topic. If, you, if you've got 10 minutes to spare, I'd recommend, or 20 minutes to spare, I'd recommend that to you in the strongest terms because it's quite brilliant. Yeah, she's fantastic, Brené, and speaks a lot about that um, issue that Alon and Graham have just touched on. Um, Alon, can I ask you, so we've talked a lot about the maintaining connection, um, caring for your employees and, and, and clients as well. How does a leader and how do employers balance that care aspect with performance? And obviously, you know, it has been a, an extended period. You, you, you can't focus purely on care. You do have to focus on performance of the business. How do you balance those two with each other and um, you know, the tension between them? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's seeing them in the first instance, not as being polarities. So caring for someone and demanding performance are not in conflict. They're not at polar opposites on end of, of the spectrum, which is how I think a lot of leaders um, naturally think about it. It's if I care for someone, I've got to give them rope. I've got to give them leeway. I've got to give them time off. I've got to expect less of them. Whereas if I'm expecting performance of someone, I can hold them accountable. I can drive them. I can um, expect a lot more. And they, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a matter of shifting the narrative because I actually think that the antidote to this languishing that I was talking about, the antidote to um, people feeling exhausted can sometimes be in um, creating a sense of progress and ambition. And what I mean by that is there's, there's a few things that I'd, I'd kind of focus on. The first one is the power of narrative. What's the power, what, what's the narrative you're telling about your business? Are people feeling like they're part of a rocket ship that's going to Mars and that is growing and that has amazing horizons ahead? Or do they feel that they're on the same treadmill at the same gym looking out the same exact window that they were in in 2019? Because humans are hardwired for progress. If we're not feeling like we're progressing, it makes us feel trapped and it makes us feel exhausted. So how can we share stories from uh, a future version of our business to inspire people and lift their gaze? Um, the second one is a sense of, of purpose and retain, retaining talent through the right signals that um, they've got a career pathway, but they've also got an impact on the world around them. So how can you connect them to a sense of purpose and progress? Uh, because again, that, that generates a, a sense of being part of something bigger than just ourselves. And it lifts our gaze from being focused on what's my job to be done this week to how am I actually connecting with the world around me? Um, the third one I'd say is, is this idea of deliberate decompression. And it's something we're working with a lot of executives on because I think it's massively underutilized as a leadership technique. And what we mean by deliberate decompression is how do you increase space for active recovery and creativity? And part of that is to be able to slow down, but also removing the immediacy of demands where possible. And it's obviously a, an artificial creation because there are always going to be demands and your list, your to-do list is always going to be endless. But how can you actually carve out whether it's a, a day at a time or half a day at a time where people can slow down and move into a different headspace? Because our brain waves, when they slow down, actually work dif uh, create a different sense of um, how we think and how we act, how we process information. Um, and the final one, and I think this is so undervalued and so important, is actually thinking of our brain food. So expanding our brain food. What I mean by that is what's the diet that your brain is on? What's the information that you're consuming? Because if you are going to be on a diet of donuts and Red Bulls, um, you know your body is going to feel like shit. So if you're on a diet of Channel 9 News that's talking about Delta, Afghanistan, lockdown, numbers, blah, 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 of course, your mind is also going to be constrained and feel like shit. So for me, the information you consume and think of it like a diet is, is going to have a direct impact on your mood, your productivity, and, and how you run your business. And so instead of thinking about um, 
all the negativity. And if I were to ask you now to name all of the news pieces you've seen lately, I'm guessing 99% of them are going to be negative. How can we reframe what our brain is actually thinking about and consuming? So in the last month, as by way of an example, and I love this, over a billion COVID-19 vaccines have been administered around the world in the last month. That's more than 30 million a day. That's almost a third of humanity that's now been reached. <clears throat> so by the end of this year, we're going to have dosed half the people on earth. So that's the single most extraordinary public health achievement in our species history ever. The vaccines have been unbelievably effective. So less than one in 25,000 um, of fully vaccinated people are um, uh, ending up in hospital and only one in 100,000 have died. So in terms of the, the achievement of, of the human um, race in the past few months, it's extraordinary. And that narrative is not being told, certainly not being told enough. So how can you be really purposeful about your brain food? Because that's going to impact not just your mindset, but the mindset of um, the people in your organization and ultimately your, your productivity and your um, success. Um, thanks for that, Alon. That was brilliant. Um, uh, we've probably got about... Um, six or seven minutes until nine. Um, I do want to ask a question to each of you. I might turn to Reese first, but we've spoken a lot about you know, the challenges that we've faced over the past 12 or 18 months. Um, can I turn to sort of a future looking um, question? And what do you think the keys are to building this strong and resilient business in the, the much spoken about COVID normal that we're expecting? I'm not sure when, but sometime. At some stage. Um, yeah, so we've got to break this question down a bit before we really get into it. And you need to look at the, the what, the why and the how of, um, of this question. So the first is the what. What is a resilient business? Um, there's lots of different ways to describe a resilient business and every business is different. But I think when you break it down, you can really say um, a resilient business is one that can absorb stress, recover critical functionality and be successful in altered surplus, sorry, circumstances. Um, so I think the, that, that's what it is. Um, and the next question is, why do you want that for your business? Um, obviously, there's a, there's a selfish uh, aspect to that, and uh, at least for the business owner, which is, um, you know, businesses are more valuable if they're resilient, um, if, if it's not something that's related directly to the owner, um, and the, the business has got good policies and procedures um, with, with uh, a diverse customer base, things like that. There's a selfish aspect which makes the business goodwill more valuable. So that's one thing. Um, but it also goes back to things that we've talked about earlier today. Um, Alon, you, um, some of the points you made about, um, you know, how you value your staff and, and all of those sorts of things and the, the non-financial things where you're providing jobs, you're providing a service or, or a product that's useful to the community, all those sorts of things come into that. Um, so that, that's kind of the why part. And the next part is how. Um, there's three key things I think you really need for a resilient business. And that is you need to have a plan. Um, that plan consists of your mission, your statement, your values, um, and your strategy of how you're going to execute that. Um, at the moment, the key thing I've been talking to clients about um, is a disaster management plan and how they're going to use that plan to recover. Uh, so that's at a very high level, that's the, the first key thing, I think. The next thing is that you have to remain adaptable and you have to be open to change. So obviously this um, situation has uh, created lots of different changes in, in all different kinds of industries. Um, and that it's caused people to look at the way they offer their products and what products they offer. Um, and really look at what's going on in the industries and how can I deliver um, new products to customers when, if, if for example, I can't trade or my old products um, aren't selling for whatever reason due to government restrictions or, or something else that's happening in the industry um, that's due to COVID. So I think you really have to be um, adaptable, look at what's happening in your industry. Are people moving more online? Have they developed a new way of delivering products? Um, and, and I think the third key thing um, is you need to look at the key parts of your organisation and engage with them all. 
those being customers, suppliers, employees. So we've talked about employees um, a lot today, but, but one thing we haven't really talked too much about is customers. Um, and this is a really key point for, uh, that, that's gonna affect different businesses uh, in different ways. Small business is obviously very different to large business um, and the types of businesses themselves. So professional services versus manufacturing um, versus other kinds of businesses. So um, I'll, I'll speak mainly to small businesses because I know we push for time, um, but for small businesses, it really is around engaging with the customers. Um, so I know uh, just, just personal experience that I've seen with some of my clients and, and friends and things like that, um, you know, you can talk about all of the high level things around having plans and, and disaster management plans and business strategies, et cetera. But a lot of the time it comes down to, is my product selling? Are my customers buying it? Um, and do I want to do something different? There's so many micro businesses that have popped up on, on Facebook marketplace and Instagram and things like that as a result of this pandemic, um, because people just are looking to do something different that they might want to create an interest for themselves. Um, or, you know, their business might not be going as well as it normally is. Um, so, you know, there's, there's people have done things in different ways and, and tried to expand their horizons a bit. And, um, and I think that's one thing that's common to business of all sizes um, is that really you need to uh, make sure you're engaging with your customers and, and look to expand your horizons, whether that is um, diversifying your product offerings, it might be um, having products or introducing new products that are complementary to your existing products. Um, talk to your customers, get feedback from them. What do they want? Um, is there something that might be easy for you to add to your existing lines or, you, you, you know, your manufacturing business um, that, um, that your existing customers want? Tap into that customer base and really engage with them to find out if there is um, something that you can do to expand your business. Absolutely. Thanks, Reese. Um, I do know that it's nine o'clock. I don't want to cut off the conversation, but if there are people who need to jump off, obviously feel welcome to do so. I'll circulate all of our panelists um, contact details and some of the things we've shared like the YouTube video of Brené Brown um, by email after this, but I, I won't cut off the conversation. So if everyone's willing to hang around for another um, few minutes, I, I'd be interested to get on everyone's thoughts on this question and uh, sort of expanding on what Reese has just said. Uh, for me, it comes down to two things. If we're talking about building businesses that are anti-fragile, businesses that are resilient, businesses that can withstand big black swans that will shake you to the core like the pandemic or like a GFC. Um, and, and I love everything that Reese has, has said. I would add to that, um, it's a deep sense of purpose and adaptability that is gonna help businesses. And, and Reese mentioned the importance of having in your strategy, a mission and a vision. I would say that having worked with so many businesses across different industries on their missions and visions, 99% of them are just words on a page. 99% of them are posters that people walk past. So my challenge to you is yes, have a mission and a vision, but bring it to life. Make it something that is, that is deeply um, rooted in the DNA of your organization that is spoken about, that is lived and breathed, that is stress tested um, against uh, what you're experiencing. So there's a, one of my favorite books and another recommendation you can add to the, the list, um, Alex, is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, who was both a Holocaust survivor, but also a psychoanalyst. And what Viktor Frankl studied was, um, he, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, which was all about purpose. And what he said was, when we have a why, we can, we've, we can bear almost any how. So when we have a purpose to live for, we can withstand great challenges and, and incredible strains on us. And I think that applies for individuals and for businesses. When businesses have a deep um, root and a deep sense of purpose, they can um, achieve disproportionate outcomes even under stress and strain. And the other one is around adaptability and adaptability comes from letting go of control. And when businesses have really strong control mechanisms, when businesses are really clear on the hierarchy, the line of um, command on the, uh, the demands of, of how you use your time and how you make decisions, that makes you fragile. 
when businesses let go of that control, it actually create, it unleashes human creativity, ingenuity, potential, and it makes you anti-fragile. And it doesn't mean everyone's running around doing what they want. It means that you're relying on purpose and emotional commitment to drive outcomes rather than on authority and rather than on rules. So that would be my, my two points. Thanks, Alon. Um, Graham or Nick, did you have anything to add from a business resilience point of view? I think just being uh, diverse, having a diverse client base, diverse staff. Um, I mean, I always thought we had to specialise in a particular sector, you know, as an accounting and financial planning firm. But what this is really, this last eight months has really shown is that having a diverse client base is, is really held us Hamilton Morello in good stead. And, and a lot of our clients have been the same, having diverse products, exactly what Reese said. And, and then also diverse staff having from different backgrounds, um, you know, different ages, genders, nationalities. I mean, that's been that's been a great um, great thing for our business and, and a lot of businesses. Um, everyone brings different skill sets, um, different uh, different history, and um, it, it's, I think that's the way the way forward for a lot of businesses. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Mm. And following on from what Alan was saying previously, you know, some take the attitude of clients come first in the business, but the suggestion is employees should come first. You look after your employees and they're going to look after your clients. And uh, that diversity, I mean, the, it's a time of change, so many challenges ahead, but uh, the younger generations are fantastic at that. That's part of their DNA. Technology is their thing. They're great with it. So really looking to the younger generations and, and there's a their understanding of technology can be a step forward as well. Um, but also not being too hard on ourselves. We're going through incredible times. We'll be talking about this for, for decades to come. So there's a lot we're learning. There's going to be mistakes along the way. People are going to have bad days. We're all going to have our bad days at work. I think we should all have a green light to have one shocker of a day at work uh, every year where we're just intolerable. Uh, so people are going to have bad days dealing with stresses. We don't know what's happening with them outside of work or what's happening with their lot with their lives but hopefully just uh yeah keeping using it as a trigger to improve those relations with your staff and, and really uh forming some good strong relationships based upon trust and understanding and people being comfortable putting their hand up and saying i'm not okay uh, i might need some help here absolutely graham and i, I second alon's comment that maybe one a year is a bit skinny i might need one a week or so <laughs> but uh, no <laughs> Um, that, that was really fantastic, guys. I mean, we, we, we've gone a little bit over time and I think we could probably talk for another hour, to be honest. It was really um, stimulating conversation. So really appreciate all of your time. Um, appreciate all of our clients, friends and contacts joining us this morning. So thank you very much and hope you, hopefully you got as much out of that as um, I certainly did. So thank you all. We'll, we will circulate some details of our panellists and um, some further things. So watch out for that in your emails today. And Otherwise, thank you very much and have a fantastic day.